We thank God for this day. How many of you all know that the Lord is good? How many of y'all really know that the Lord is good? God is great. Our God, we know intimately as our Lord and Savior Jesus. 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 There is something about that name. Jesus. 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 Like the fragrance after the rain. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there is something about that name oh Jesus 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 there is something about that name Master Savior Jesus like the fragrance after the rain oh, oh Jesus 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 let all him and earth proclaim kings and kingdom will all pass away but there is something about that name but there is something about But there is something about that name. If you believe in the power of that name, lift your hands. But there is something about that name. If you know it for yourself, just lift your hands. But there is, but there is something about that name. But there is something about that name. Come on and lift him today. For he's great. He's so great that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is something. There is something about that name. There's a word from the Lord today in the Old Testament book of Judges, the seventh chapter, verses one through seven. It would be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and then Judges. Some of y'all looked at me like, uh-oh, that's a funny book. 
usually don't go to Judges, Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. When you have found it, won't you stand for the reading of God's holy word? If you have not found it, your Bible might be like mine last night. It was sticky. And I passed over it. I knew it was there and I had to go back. So don't be, no, there's no shame going to the table of contents, even if you know where it is. Sometimes those pages get stuck. The judges, the seventh chapter. Verses 1 through 7. And as is our custom, won't you hold your Bibles high and repeat after me? This is, this is the Word of God. Word of God. It, has it has liberated and transforming power. And transforming power. I, will I will praise God for this preaching moment. This preaching moment. And I declare, I declare that after this moment, after this moment that I shall never, I shall ever, be the same. God be praised. In Judges 7, 1 through 7, in the New Revised Standard Version, these words are faithfully recorded. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the troops that were with him rose early and camped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them, the hill of Moray in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, the troops with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Israel would only take credit away from me, saying my own hand has delivered me. Now therefore proclaim this in the hearing of the troops. Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home. Thus Gideon sifted them out. 22,000 returned and 10,000 remained. Then the Lord said to Gideon, the troops are still too many. Take them down to the wall. And I will sift them out for you there. When I say this one shall go with you, he shall go with you. And when I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the troops down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, all those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps, you shall put to one side. All those who kneel down to drink, putting their hands to their mouths, you shall put to the other side. The number of those that lapped was 300, but all the rest of the troops knelt down to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 that lapped, I will deliver you and give the Midianites into your hand. Let all the others go to their homes. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word, edification of our hearts and our souls. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We want to call your attention to the entirety of the verses today, but we want to stop as an introduction to verse 7. Then the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 that lapped, I will deliver you and give the Midianites into your hand. Let all the others go to their homes. I want to talk today from the subject, trusting God with limited resources. Gideon said, go with the 300 and tell the others to go home. Trusting God with limited resources. Let us bow our head for a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this day. For we have come into this house, gathered in your name to worship you. 
Now, Lord, touch the words of my mouth. Let them not be of my own understanding nor my opinion. Lord, let them fall fresh from you. Someone may be liberated and transformed by the renewing of their mind. This indeed is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Trusting God with limited resources. Today we find in the text Israel under the oppression of the Midianites due to what seems to be their consecutive unfaithfulness to God. God had delivered them, but yet they forgot the God of their weary years and the God of their silent tears. We learn from Israel that a people whose freedom has been predicated on God, that yet find themselves unfaithful, will continually find themselves succumbing to oppression. This oppression of Israel, the Israelites, was not a brutal oppression, was not the oppression that we have become most acquainted with in modern times. But it is oppression nonetheless that is equal to our modern time. The oppression that the Midianites were putting on the Israelites was economic oppression. Every time Israel had a harvest, every time they got their camels together, because camels of the time were of great monetary value, every time they got together, the Midianites would put an army to come together and rampage their land. Not only of economic oppression, but mental oppression. Our people suffer today not from the chains of the South, not from the bruises on our backs, but yet the bruises of our very state of mind um, that makes oppression today even more dynamically dangerous than the oppression of enslaved Africans. Every time they got ahead, Midianites would come down and the Midianites came down with such strength that the Bible says that they ran into the cave. Running into the caves, hiding because they felt that God had forsaken them. When the Israelites finally had enough, read 6 Ruth and seven, will you get home? When Israelites finally had enough, as Israel oftentimes does, the text says that they cried unto the Lord. Enough was enough. And as a people, it's time for us to cry unto the Lord. We crying everywhere else but to the law. But I tell you that if the God of the God of enslaved Africans is to be called to come to our rescue, he'll hear our cry. We got to cry only to the Lord. So Israel cries to the Lord for help. And God nominates Gideon, one of the judges of the Old Testament, to deliver his people. You might say, what is a judge? Let me take you to a little Bible class. The judge was before the kings. And the judges were selected by God to lead Israel. But not from a monarchic status, but as one that would hear from God. And some of these judges, in Gideon's case, were warriors. Because they were called upon to fight for their people. That's Bible class. It's gone now. Now you know what to judge. And so 
God nominates Gideon. And I came by with the good news this morning. That isn't it good to know that when we cry unto the Lord, that the Lord will answer. Isn't it good to know that when we cry to the Lord, God will select just what you need when you need it most. I wish I had four people here this morning that know about crying unto the Lord. Isn't it good to know that when you're in your mess of unfaithfulness, that God's grace and God's mercy is sufficient to hear your cry and answer by him. So God hears the cries of his people. And he answers their cry. So God has a discussion with Gideon. And Gideon's response is indicative of Israel's faithfulness. You know what Gideon says to God? God comes to Gideon and says, I want you to lead your people against the Midianites. Gideon has the nerve to say to God, where have you been all this time? We've been struggling all this time. Now you talking to me, God? Gideon goes through a soliloquy. We were delivered out of Egypt. And Moses crossed the Red Sea. God, you delivered us. But where are you now? I stopped by here to tell you, don't ever ask God where he is now when he's right in front of you. Don't let your past transgressions, your past hurts stop you from doing something for God right now. I declare today under the power of the Holy Ghost that God is telling somebody right now that I'm going to deliver you. I don't care about where you have been. I don't care about what happened. If God is with you right now, if God be with you, who can be against you? So he questioned God. It's nice, God, but where have you been? Then he further takes a gaze into his resources. And Gideon says, but God, I'm of the weakest clan. Why are you picking me? Can I talk about it? God, my family ain't been in the tabernacle 50 years. Oh, let me break it down. God, my daddy wasn't a preacher. God, uh, uh, my mother wasn't on the mother's board. God, uh, 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 my uncle wasn't a deacon. God, uh, uh, my folks don't have the money like everybody else. God, why are you picking me? Because the world has determined that there's so many clans greater than me. God, why are you picking me? And yet, he picks Gideon. Gideon perceived that his resources seemingly made it difficult for him to trust God. And I want you to know today God is speaking to you. Don't believe the hype of what anybody says. God is speaking to you. You are good enough. You have the right background. You have the right pedigree. No matter where you're from, for God to speak to you. Don't let your resources, don't let your life status make you ever think that God doesn't have something for you to do. Eventually, the text informs us that Gideon despite his limited resources, trusted God. And that Gideon defeated the Midianites and became a 40-year judge of Israel. Often God calls you and I to go into battle for him. Causes us to rise up out of our circumstances. But when God calls us, we are blinded by our resources. 
Somebody here said, I'm not ready to go back to school because I'm not smart enough. Somebody here said, I'm not ready for a promotion because I don't know enough. Somebody here said, I'm not ready to step out on faith because I don't have enough money. God is calling you, but oftentimes we miss the call of God because our perceived limited resource. But the key to our ability to live a long life's way is not our ability to pull from our resources, but it's our ability to trust in God. We often miss the expansion of our territory, bound by expectations of what is deemed appropriate. And we believe it takes certain things to have Holy Ghost success. And I want you to know the only thing you need for Holy Ghost success is the Holy Ghost. Not what you think is necessary to experience God. Not what you think is necessary to reach out and grab your breakthrough. The stuff that you think is important is not important at all. I believe that's why the songwriter said only what you do for Christ will last. That's for my old schoolers. Only what you do for Christ will last. In fact, watch this show. If we are not careful, our lack of faith brought on by perceived limited resources can cause us a life of discontent. Some of us here are living lives of discontent. We mad about everything. See, I live in the real world after Sunday. I can talk about it. Ain't nobody right on the job but you. And you got the nerve to tell, to believe that the Lord is telling you that you're right. That ain't nothing but the devil. Discontent. God has blessed you with so much. But you can't see God. God has done so much. In your church, I'm not talking to y'all, I'm talking to Facebook. Facebook, God has done so much for y'all in your church that you still can never be happy. Because the resources are not lining up. Things don't look like you think they should look. They don't move like you think. They should move. Watch this. Can I tell you something? Every now and then, my workout bench talks to me. So when I was doing this sermon and, and I was on sit-up number 55, the, the workbench talked to me. The workbench said, Pastor, I said, yes, workbench. Discontent means dissatisfaction with God. Oh, you better catch that thing. Discontent means you dissatisfied with God. And so we can't grasp our agenda because we really live lives dissatisfied with God. Because whatever God's doing for you, you need to shout glory, hallelujah. If God gave you a job, you ought to be glad you're getting a check. It's better, I'm telling you, it's better to catch hell on work than to not get a check. I want you to know, but when you discontent, you dissatisfied with God. Is there anybody here that wants to stop right now and say, God, if you never do anything else, you've done enough. You better check your discontent. Because every time you're discontent, that means whatever God has in front of you, you've told God, this ain't enough for me. My house ain't enough for me. My family ain't enough for me. My bank account ain't enough for me. My church ain't enough for me. Who are you to say what God can bless you with? I thank him for anything that he done for me. Because he didn't have to wake me up this morning. He didn't have to start me on my way. Be careful. 
You think you're dissatisfied with your family members? You're dissatisfied with God. Because you got to thank God for the family that he gave you. Somebody is all alone by themselves. Wish they had some knuckleheads to deal with. And you got 20 of them to deal with. You ought to be happy. You ought to be happy. Discontent. Discontent can really be dissatisfaction with God because every, every piece of atmosphere you in, God's got you in there for a reason. And when you buck against that thing where you can't not find joy, uh -uh, then you are dissatisfied really in essence with God. We learn from Gideon how to effectively trust God with limited resources. Can I take a commercial break right now? Is there anybody here got some limited resources? Come on, y'all ain't rich in here. I, I looked at the offering plate, y'all ain't rich. Ah! No, I don't look, I don't look, I don't look, I don't. Look at your neighbor and say, he don't look, he don't look. All of us want a little more. All of us have limited resources. But we got to trust God with limited resources. And we learned from Gideon today how to effectively trust God with limited resources. First thing you got to understand, you got to know the purpose of your limited resources. You know why you don't have everything that you think? you need? You want to know why things don't always work out? You want to know why your climb sometimes feels more difficult than other people's climb? Let's go to Judges 7, 1 through 7. God tells Gideon uh, um, that if I give you every resource you need, if I make you large and in charge, the Israelites will forget that it is me that brought them through. If you have a big old bank account, you might think that you could pay your way through. But if you got limited resources and watch God take a little to bring a bountiful blessing, then you know when you get on your knees that if it had not been for the Lord on your side, where, oh, where would you be? So you got limited resources, not because you can't make it, but God wants to show the world what he can do through you. So God tells them and reminds them, we did a sermon on this so many months ago that your resource is not your source. So God wants us to know and he gives us limited resources so we can understand that God and God alone can bring us here. God and God alone can bring us out. There are no activities, there are no strings that we can pull. But when God puts his hand on the thing, see, when you have limited resources, you can tap into what's limitless. God is limitless. We are limited, but God is limitless. So what it is in your life that you keep bouncing your head up against the wall about? Give it over to God. Trust God. It ain't about you. It's what God wants to do through you. It ain't about how smart you are. It is about the divine intelligence of God. It ain't about how you like it. It's about what God can do. So you got to understand when you got limited resources, when stuff starts going down, that's when your shout needs to take place. Because that means God is setting you up for your shout. Because there's few folks here, if you look back over your life, there have been some impossible situations you've been in. If you look back over your life, uh -uh, you didn't always have everything that you wanted to have, but somehow you trusted in God. And, and when you trusted in God, he gave you the strength to fight your battles. You had limited resources, but God became revealed in you when you realized God could do something beyond yourself to bring you out. Second thing we learned from Gideon, when you have God, you don't need what you think you need. 
Did y'all catch it? Some of us spend our lives trying to convince folk to go with us on the journey. But God wants us to understand you don't need what you think you need. That there's some folk that are better not in the peanut gallery and outside of the peanut gallery because God wants to do something. Who is going to bed at night worrying about what somebody's thinking about you? That's just God moving them out the way so he can show up. You don't need the people you think you need. You don't need the money you think you need. You don't need the peace of mind you think you need. You, what's the best, our biggest word? I need to get myself together. Baby, you ain't been together for 50 years. You don't need. We've been waiting for you to get together. You ain't together yet. Oh, y'all know this. I'm under construction. Well, we've been building the building for a long time. Just trust him. Stop making excuses and just trust him. You don't need what you think you need. Look at your neighbor and say, you don't need it. Oh, can I have a little fun? It ain't my business. Say, it ain't my business. But you don't need it. I'm going to get y'all out of here. This thinking what you need is dangerous to a church that believes it needs certain things to be successful. And most of those things are rooted in the past. You don't need a thousand voices to experience the Lord. You don't need a certain protocol or order of service to experience the Lord. You don't need proper protocols to experience the Lord. You don't need all of these things. And if we're not careful, we become discontent with God. Because the reality is, a lot of traditionalists, they chase what used to be. Bound by what used to be. But missing the fight that God has given them today. Liberators, I believe God is blessing us. And God has done exceeding and abundantly above all we could ask over these five years. I know what God has done, but let me tell you, I can't chase no ghosts. I ain't going to chase when the choir was full. I'll give God some praise with three folks placing his name. I don't care if my name is ever lifted up in higher halls. I don't need all that. All I need is Jesus. Lose no sleep about what somebody else did, what somebody else said. Guess what? Nobody that has ever stood here before can do a better Andrew Hunt than Andrew Hunt can. Take it to the bank. Watch this, watch this, watch this. And so, the reason why I can't be discontent. This is for y'all shout. Liberty, y'all enough for me. If we never do anything better, y'all enough for me. I love you. I, I, I would do anything for you. You are enough right now. Every singer is enough. Every deacon is enough. Every nurse is enough. Every usher is enough. Every member is enough. I dare not be discontent with what the Lord has blessed me with. You are enough. Nobody here needs to hold your head down. Keep your head up. You are enough. God's got some great stuff that he's going to do with us. But God cannot bless us if we dissatisfied. So if no seat ever gets filled, you are enough. I ain't discontent with God. 
I'm satisfied with God. I don't need the perfect octave in the choir loft. I need some folks that's going to smile and give God some praise. I don't need perfection. I don't need professionalism. What I need is somebody that's going to say, for God I live and for God I die. I'll trust. I'll trust in the Lord. And when you do that, God will begin to transform you. God will begin to develop you to the person that you need to be. We got to learn that everybody in your life ought to be enough for you. Enough. Liberators, you are enough. Don't let anybody tell you to flip back the page of the time. Make you think you're not enough. Right now, you enough. Seasoned citizens, I'm starting to experience some aches and pains now. Maybe not like you, but I ain't concerned with who you are 40 years ago. I'm concerned if you're right here right now, you are. God's going to expand our territory, but God can't if we don't see that we are enough. That if we don't believe that with what we got right now, with our ability right now, God can do some majestic and some wonderful things. If we can sit up here and look around at how good God has been to us and not realize how God has blessed us with limited resources, then we are really dissatisfied with God. Well, God took... Gideon through an exercise of enough. When you trust God with limited resources, the first thing you can't do is you can't be scared. The Bible says that Gideon said, all of y'all that's fearful and trembling, go home. If you can't handle this assignment, go home. And the Bible says 22,000 went home. That left 10,000. Can I do a little algebra for you? That means there were 32,000 in the beginning, but because they were afraid, Gideon said, go home. And I want you to know that when you trust God, you don't need to be afraid. When you trust God and God has told you to do something, liberators, don't be afraid. Because if God is with you, who can be against you? Don't be afraid. So there's 22,000 left. Um, the other thing that Gideon does, God looks and says, you still got too many. Gideon must have thought that 32,000 was enough or the best that he had. But now God has dwindled them down to 10,000. Then God says, even with 10,000, Gideon, you might not give me the glory and the honor and the praise. So Gideon says, let me get rid of them one by one. I like this because the second verse was not a collective verse. In the first, in the first episode, a group went home. But God strategically says, one by one, I'll send them home. There's some one by ones that need to be sent home in your life. One by one. It's in the book. It's in the book. So Gideon says on the next test, have them go down to the water. And the ones, and I'm going to segregate them by the ones who bend down and put their hand in the water and drink the water. Can I keep it real to y'all? I would have been that one. Proper and bougie. I would have bent down and I would have put my hand in the water because it's proper technique. If I'm going to fight the battle to put my hand in the water and look forward. Come on, if y'all want to be real about it. All of us in here would have been. And then he said, but then the ones that lap like a dog. I, I want to see the ones that are going to bend down. But let me know the ones that are going to lap like a dog. And so there were 300 of the 10,000 that lapped like a dog. 
Now in my mind's eye, if it was Andrew Hunt, I would have picked the ones that would have been bougie and proper. Because the church would have taught me that I need to pick the folks who are bougie and proper. Because that might indicate where their family is from. That might indicate what their education is being. And so it would be appropriate, bougie and proper, to go and, and acknowledge the ones that are holding the water in their hands. But God's got a special way of not being concerned with bougie or proper. And so the Bible says that there were 300 that lapped like a dog. Y'all know I love my dog Francis. And when Francis is thirsty, he runs past me. He runs past China. The house could be on fire, but Francis is going to go to his bowl and lick his bowl. Francis ain't looking at nothing. All he knows is this some water. And so why would God choose somebody that's not bougie and proper? Can I leave you with a shout? And I'm almost through today. God chose them because of one that lapped like Francis. They are not alert. They are not cautious. All they know is that God said fight and I'm going to fight. So when I need to get some water, I don't need to look up because I know that if God is with me, who can be against me? I don't need to be bougie and I don't need to be proper because when he plants me by the rivers of waters, I'll just drink so I can get up and I can fight because if I just lose my inhibitions, is there anybody here that wants to lose their inhibitions and give God some praise and trust in God? Trust him. That's why, that's why the third thing that happens later on in the seventh chapter, we're going to get on home today, is that, could watch this, y'all. It ain't in the text. I like to do these so y'all can read when you get home. You know how if, if you trust in God with limited resources and, and, and some of y'all up against some giants right now, I don't even want you to raise your hand. But in your mind, just, just, just raise your hand if you up against some giants right now. Can I give you something to shout about? If you got some giants to get up against, can I tell y'all something? It ain't in the text that I read today. But when you trust in God with limited resources, God will let your enemies know that they can't beat you. That's why your enemies are frustrated. Because when they look at you, they know they can't do nothing with you. When they talk about you, they know they can't stop you. When they try to derail, they know they can't mess with you. Oh, it's in the book. Somebody say, it's in the book. It's in the book. Go on and keep on reading. Gideon is still unfaithful. Gideon still wants a word from the Lord. And so God tells Gideon, sneak over into the Midianite camp. And when you sneak over there, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. And Gideon happens to hear one in the, in the Midianite army begin to tell a dream. He told his comrades a dream. He said, I had a dream I, um, that Gideon came over here and wiped us all out. The opposing army was already notified by God that, he couldn't, that they couldn't do nothing with Gideon. And I want you to know that that devil on your life that you're shrinking down to because you don't think you have enough, he loves for you to stay shrunk because God has already told him that you can beat him, that you are better than him, that you are stronger than him. He's already told you. So don't you get dismayed by what folks got to say. They, the more they talk, the more they know that God is with you. Trust in God with limited resources. So the text informs us that Gideon finally trusted God. The Bible says with 300 men, now down from 32,000, now to 300, he gave 300 men some jars and some trumpets. And we find that Gideon says, God tells Gideon, take them on down, these 300 men, and start the war with the Midianites. And the Bible says that Gideon and 300 men, separated in three groups of 100, began to shout for the Lord and for Gideon. And can I bring you to something today? I need your help today. The Bible says that they began to smash the jars. And the Bible says 
that 300 men began to blow the horns. And so I can imagine that 300 men probably sound like 30,000 men. And so the Midianites got scared and they began to run from Gideon. Do y'all remember COVID? Do y'all remember when I was in here by myself and there were seven folk in here, but we shouted glory, hallelujah. Is there anybody here that wants to trust in God? And if you want to trust him, shout for him right now. Praise him right now. Lift him right now so the devil can flee from your prayer. God specializes in blessing those he loves with limited resources. He gave Noah an ark with no rain. He gave Abraham a ram in the bush. Limited resources. He gave Moses a rod and gave Samson hair. He gave David a slingshot. And would later give David's descendant, Jesus, a cross and a borrowed tomb. And so God specializes in blessing those with limited resources. So you're saying, Pastor, that sounds good. He gave Noah an ark with no rain. And he gave Abraham a ram. He gave Moses a rod, and he gave Samson hair. He gave David a slingshot, and he gave Jesus the cross. Well, pastor, what has God given me? Well, I stopped by here in Liberty to say in the year of expansion, we don't need gimmicks, and we don't need tradition. All we got to do is have the word of God. If we trust in him and never doubt, he will surely bring me out. For the Bible says, I'm the head and not the tail. The Bible says, we've been endured for a night, but joy comes in the morning time. Is there anybody here that wants to trust God today? with limited resources. He will, he will answer our prayers. <laughs>